Hey, good morning. Welcome to New Heights, everyone. Everyone joining us here at Central Vancouver, as well as all of our friends at New Heights East, uh, New Heights West Vancouver, New Heights Battleground. We're thrilled to have you joining us. And I, I love that we're kicking off this, uh, this weekend just with kind of a couple of those highlights photos from last weekend, homecoming weekend. Uh, because when we did homecoming weekend, that was really the, the start of this new fall season that we're entering into. And uh, for me, every time I get into the fall season, I always think back to my freshman year of college. Um, the college that I attended uh, required all freshmen to live on campus in the dorms. Um, but also that meant that the college went to great lengths to make sure that they would try to pair you up with the right roommate. And so they sent a pretty elaborate questionnaire to all of the incoming freshmen. And, um, but for me, I mean, my freshman year, I wasn't really worried about the roommate situation because my best friend from Vancouver was, um, was going to that same college that I was going to. And we, had, we were going to write each other's names down, that we're going to be roommates, we're going to room together. Um, so in most of the dorm rooms at, at my university, they were two-person dorm rooms. So we, didn't, we weren't even worried about a third guy being dropped in our room. We, we were set. And, um, but here's what I remember. Uh, it stands out to me so clearly. It's when the university mailed this uh, questionnaire, uh, this roommate questionnaire. It was probably like five pages, uh, 100, 150 questions on, on this pretty long questionnaire, um, all wanting to get after your, your personality, your personal preferences, all that. So here's the way the questionnaire started off. Question number one, if you already have a roommate, please write his or her name here. So we wrote each other's names, and again, we knew like, okay, well, we're going to room together, but just in case, just in case we do get a roommate, let's both fill out our questionnaires exactly the same and uh, make sure that we both have the same answers and, and, we, and we send them in at the same time. So we did that. Question number two was, um, do you keep your room neat and orderly? Would you mind living with someone who isn't neat and orderly? How many people are in your family? Uh, what time do you generally go to bed at night? What time do you generally wake up in the morning? How much time do you spend listening to music during the day? <clears throat> what types of music do you listen to? Check all that apply. Grunge, ska, punk, techno. Remember, this is the 90s. <clears throat> How much time do you spend watching TV? Um, what's your favorite food? Are you a vegetarian? Do you have any food allergies? Do you play any sports? What are your favorite hobbies? Describe your study habits. Are you a perfectionist? Do you plan ahead? Are you, do you do last minute all-nighters? And the list went on and on and on. Like I said, probably five pages on, on that questionnaire. And I remember when I first got that, I remember thinking, wow, this school really cares about matching, matching up the right roommates together. But again, I wasn't worried about it because me and my best friend, we were going to room together. So we mailed our questionnaires back to the school. And then a few weeks before school got started, they, the school mailed us our roommate assignments. And I tore it open and saw very top of the page, my best friend was not listed as my roommate. <laughs> and I didn't just have two people in my dorm room. I had four people in my dorm room. So I was like, all right, time out. There's a problem here. I called the school to find out what was going on. And the school said, ah, yes, yeah, sorry about that. We had a glitch in our system. And we over-enrolled the freshman class this year. So right now, we're going around, we're putting an extra set of bunk beds in all of our freshman dorm rooms, converting our two-person rooms into four-person rooms. And we ran out of time, so we didn't look at the questionnaires, so we just randomly dropped four people in your room. <laughs> Enjoy your freshman year. We'll see you in a couple weeks. So that was the start of my roommate situation my freshman year. And, and I remember my, uh, my, one of my roommates, I am convinced the school put the most obnoxious student on campus in my dorm room. I mean, and he was known across campus to be that way. One of his favorite things to do was, was this. He would, he would wait until he was ready to go to bed. And he, he would go to bed really, really late. Not just normal college late, you know, like 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. He would go to bed at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And his favorite thing to do would be to step out into the hall. And he would yell as loud as he could, Wake up, everybody! It's 3 o'clock in the morning! And then he'd close the door, step back inside the dorm room, crawl in bed, and go to sleep. Having woken everyone else up in the dorm, he was like, oh, that's fine with me. I'm going to go to sleep. That's the kind of guy who was, who was my roommate. Don't feel too bad for me, though, because uh, the next three years, my best friend and I, we did get to room together. And this was the view out our dorm room window for three years. 
Yeah, I know. It's a pretty sweet view. San Diego, California, watching the sunset across the Pacific Ocean each night. That's not a bad place to spend a few years of your life. But here's what I do remember about my freshman year roommate situation. I I learned a couple valuable lessons. One of them is this, that sometimes we try too hard to find the right roommate. Sometimes we try too hard. And, And in hindsight, when I consider that 150 questionnaire, you know, question survey that the college sent, it kind of feels like they were trying a little too hard. Like, you know, I I don't really think we're going to take all of those questions into account to try to find the right roommates. And and when you do that, then sooner or later, the second thing happens, that sometimes you give up too easily to find the right roommate. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall in the admissions office. The day that they were talking about those questionnaires, And they were discussing, hey, should we look at the first question on this application? You know, when people wrote in who they want to be their roommate, and someone's like, nah, just chuck them all in the garbage. Forget question number one, and so often we can give up too easily when we're looking for the right roommate. Now, here's the thing. If you've ever looked, searched for roommates, then you've experienced some of this, but but we experience this in other areas of our life too, don't we? What if we changed the word roommate to colleague? Sometimes we try too hard to find the right colleague, the right coworkers, and and we look at where we're at, and we're like, ah, okay, well, I don't really love the people I work with, so I'm going to quit that job and look for another job over here, and maybe I'll find the perfect coworkers here, and then we realize, oh, well, these people, they're not the perfect set of coworkers either, so I'm going to leave that job and go to this one over here, and you look, and you keep jumping from job to job, just looking for, like, the right, the perfect coworkers, the colleagues, and you realize, maybe they don't exist. And we end up overcomplicating. We try too hard to find just the right or perfect colleagues. Or, or maybe you're one of the, the hiring managers at your work, and, and you look and you say, look, it is a very complicated process to hire someone here. So what if we just hire the next person that walks through the door, and you give up too easily, and you end up hiring the wrong person, and it's not the right fit for the culture of your organization? You see, we can experience this not just with roommates, but with colleagues and coworkers. But also we can experience these things with our friendships too. Last week, we started this new series called Forming Friendships in a Lonely World. And last week, we saw this snapshot of just how painful life can be when we feel all alone. But we also saw just how wonderful life can be when we're fully known by a real authentic relationship in our life. And, and the problem is we all want that type of relationship in our life, don't we? But we don't always know how to start or strengthen that type of a healthy, authentic relationship in our life. And if we don't know how to start or strengthen healthy, authentic relationships, well, then we experience this, that sometimes we try too hard to start those relationships and friendships in our life. And we, we try too hard and, and we say, okay, who are all the people that, that, I, that I could choose from? That, that, okay, how about this person? No, I can't be a friend with that person because of this reason. How about this person? No, not that person for these reasons. How about these people? And then before long, we end up eliminating everyone in our life because we're trying too hard, overcomplicating the process. And then we land here and say, well, forget it. I'm just going to give up on the whole thing. And we tell ourselves, I don't have enough time for new relationships. I don't have enough energy for new relationships. Or maybe you say, I'm too old to start new relationships, or I'm too young to start new relationships. Whatever our reason is, sometimes we try too hard to find the right friendships, and sometimes we give up too easily to find the right friendships. Let me tell you, if you've ever been here before, if you've ever experienced one of these in your life, then I'm so glad that you're here today, because today we're looking at a passage of Scripture that addresses this very thing. The passage we're looking at comes to us from Luke chapter 6. And it's a passage that will give us this snapshot of Jesus initiating new relationships in his life. But before we look at this passage, i got to give you a little bit of context to the story that we're jumping into right in the middle. Um, uh, Lots of us, most of us in this room, have heard of Jesus and his 12 disciples. Even if this is your first time to New Heights, or if you haven't been in church in a long time, then chances are you've at least heard of Jesus and his 12 disciples. Now, in the New Testament, the second part of the Bible, those 12 men that are following Jesus, sometimes they're referred to as disciples, sometimes they're called apostles, sometimes they're just called followers of Jesus. But you know what Jesus calls them at the end of his three-year ministry? Do you know what he calls them? He calls them friends. Jesus refers to these 12 men as his friends. Have you ever stopped and wondered, how did Jesus start those friendships? How did Jesus initiate those relationships in his life? And and how did Jesus strengthen those relationships? 
Well, Luke chapter 6 paints that picture for us. Luke chapter 6 tells us how Jesus started and strengthened those relationships in his life. And when we look at Jesus' model, when we look at how Jesus started new relationships in his life and strengthened those relationships, we all can begin to assess our lives and say, all right, Lord, how can I follow his same pattern and start and strengthen new relationships in my life? So I'm excited that I get to share the passage with you. It's Luke chapter 6. We're picking up the story in verse 12. We've printed it for you in your program, or you can turn there in your Bible. Um, But we're going to start with verse 12. This is what it says. It says, One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. All right, let me pause right here. Because throughout the New Testament, um, throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read, um, this is not the first time and it's not the last time that we read that Jesus goes off to a secluded place to spend time praying. But this is the only time in scripture that we read that he spent the entire night in prayer. That, that is from the beginning of the night to the end of the night. And when you and I read that, we can say, wow, that is a long time to be praying, spent the entire night praying to God. W- what on earth could he be praying about? And because for you and I, we could say, okay, when I pray that, when I pray 30 seconds at nighttime, I start to fall asleep and put myself to sleep. Uh, But here, Jesus is praying the entire night. Why? What's he praying about? And the answer is, he's preparing for what's going to take place the next morning. You see, Jesus knows that he's about to go select a group of individuals who he will invest the next three years of his life into. And that they will not just be his friends, but his followers. And that he will draw them close to himself. So that's why Jesus spent the night praying to God. For you and I, when we are considering relationships in our life, we can take a page out of Jesus' book here. That is, if we're looking to start new relationships in our life, where do we start? We start here by prayerfully seeking God. Prayerfully seek God. That is, before you go talk to those individuals that you want to build a relationship with, first, talk to the Lord. It's like this, before you go select new roommates, talk to him before you talk to them. Before you go look for new colleagues, talk to him before you talk to them. Before you invite that couple over to your house for dinner, talk to him before you talk to them. Or before you download that dating app, friends, talk to him and then talk to him again and then talk to him a third time and say, Lord Jesus, please guide me. Before I start swiping left and right, talk to him before you talk to them. (laughs) Listen, All of us have an opportunity to prayerfully seek God and invite him into our lives and then invite him into our relationships and guide us and and ask him to give us wisdom and discernment in our relationships. And if we invite the Lord into our lives and ask him to give us direction and discernment in our relationships, then he's able to guide us closer to the right people and he's able to guide us away from the wrong people. And that's exactly what we see happens here with Jesus. Take a look at verse 13. It says, When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. All right, so here in Jesus' ministry, this is Luke chapter 6, so it's early in Jesus' ministry. Um, There's a crowd, there's individuals that have started following Jesus. And some of them have started following him just because they've heard his teaching, and they say, I want to li- hear more of that. So they start following him. And others are following Jesus because Jesus has told them, follow me. So there's a, there's a large crowd of disciples, and from that large crowd of disciples or followers, Jesus chose 12 of them. He picked 12 in particular. And from those 12, it says, Luke says that he designated them apostles. Now, apostle means messenger. So here, Jesus is not just selecting friends, but he's selecting individuals who are going to be his messengers, people who are going to carry the message of Jesus Christ to the whole world. But in this moment, we see that Jesus is still careful about his selection. And that's how he starts these relationships. First, he prayerfully seeks God. And second, he carefully selects these individuals. And you and I can follow that same pattern. The second thing is for us to carefully select our friends, to carefully select friends. First, you prayerfully seek God, and then when you say, okay, Lord, who are the people you've placed around me? Now, help me carefully select friends. Now, when we read this, and we read this passage, and we, and we hear this, we stop and we say, okay, well, this is where we can kind of start to mess things up a little bit, because we're worried about who. 
Who do I choose to come be with me? Who, who do I choose to be my friends? And this is where we can start to go off the rails a little bit and say, well, I'm going to overcomplicate the process and I'm going to try too hard and I'm going to mess it up. Or I'm going to give up too easily and I'm going to abandon people and, and then I'm still left all alone feeling isolated. So, so how? How do we choose the people? And for that, to answer that, we got to look at who Jesus selected. You see, because we end up ruling a lot of people out and crossing them off the list before we even consider them. But we see that's not what Jesus did. And we see we can learn something about how to set our expectations with the people that he selected. So let's look at who he selected. It's the next verse. Verse 14 tells us. These are the 12 disciples that Jesus selected. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called a zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. All right, when you and I first read this list, we could say, wow, that's, that must be a really spiritual group of men right there. I mean, I bet it, at nighttime, they probably glow in the dark. <laughs> or when they walk into a room, you can just hear the angelic voices, ha, ah, like that, because they're so spiritual and so holy. But in fact, this group of individuals is every bit as broken and messed up as you and I are today. When I read this list, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but probably a lot of us in this room and at our campuses, when we read the list of the, of the 12 disciples, your mind might quickly go to a popular TV show that's streaming online right now called The Chosen. Again, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but in the Edmonds household, we are marching through that show one episode at a time. And then after the episode, we open up the Bible and we read um, the actual account of what happened. And, uh, and, and some of you are saying, wow, that's a wild Friday night at the Edmonds household. <laughs> we love it, okay? But one of the reasons why I, why I love this show, uh, The Chosen, is not because of its biblical accuracy. Because like I said, you got to go back to the Bible and say, okay, what actually happened and what didn't happen? What's made for TV and, what, and what's actually in the Bible? One of the reasons why I love that show is because it shows this picture of the humanity of these 12 disciples. It shows kind of the, the brokenness of their own relationships, the drama that happens amongst that group, and it, it just shows them as real people. And it reminds me that, that Jesus selected a group of individuals to spend time with and invest time with who are every bit as broken as you and I. And, and, and he still chose them. He still picked them. And Jesus, when he selected these 12 men, he didn't pick the most prestigious and important people in society. But look at these first four names, Simon, who he named Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, and John. Those four, those four had the closest relationship with Jesus. They always appear at the top of the list in every one of the lists of the disciples. And we see that these individuals had the closest relationship with Jesus throughout the New Testament. But you know what these four people did for a living? They were fishermen. They were professional fishermen. And in the first century, that wasn't a real prestigious job. And, to have, and for Jesus, in order to say, these are my closest friends, my, my closest followers, Jesus is not getting a lot out of those men at the time. That is, he's not asking these guys to follow him because they're so important in society. But rather, being a fisherman, you're, you're pretty low on the ladder rung in terms of importance and prominence within society. I mean, kind of the only benefit to having a fisherman as a friend is maybe you get to use their boat every once in a while. And we all love a friend who owns a boat. So, I mean, that's one benefit, right? Aside from that, there's not a lot of other benefits. And yet Jesus chose them anyway. When you and I pick friends, it, it could be easy for us to fall into the trap of saying, okay, who's the most important or the most prestigious or who's the wealthiest or, or who's, who's important that I can go kind of buddy up next to and be a friend with? But that's not what Jesus models for us here. Also, Jesus does not shy away from drama within this group that he selects. Look at these two names, Matthew and Simon. You know, Matthew was a tax collector, which means he works for the Roman government. Simon the Zealot was this, um, this radical who was trying to take down the Roman government. So between these two, don't you think there was a, tensions were kind of high? And yet Jesus still says, all right, both of you, you're in my community group. Let's all spend time together and see what happens. You see, Jesus doesn't shy away from the drama, but he recognizes drama just comes with relationships. But you and I, if we're selecting new friendships in our lives, and if we start to get this hint of drama that's going to that's gonna show up in someone's life, then we run for the hills. We say, I don't want anything to do with that person, right? 
And, we, and then we start, we unfriend them, we unfollow them, we ghost their, their text messages, we screen their calls, and then we start to see them walk towards us in a grocery store, run around and hide behind some other aisle or something like that. We hide from them. Why? Because we don't want any more drama in our life. And we say, look, if a relationship is going to bring drama, I don't want any part of it. But that's not what Jesus does when he selects these men. And oftentimes we tend to look for people to have relationships with who are going to be an encouragement to us, who are going to build us up. They're only going to be super positive. But that's not what Jesus does. Look at this name, Thomas. You know what Thomas's nickname is? Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Because he's kind of the Debbie Downer of the group. He's like the Eeyore who's, you know, the glass is always half empty for him. There's this one, one passage in the book of John where Jesus tells his disciples, all right, boys, come with me. Um, we're going to go help this individual over here. And Thomas says, okay, we might as well go with Jesus because we're probably all going to die anyway. And he's like, all right. And they march out. That's the kind of guy that he is. He's, Thomas is not exactly the yes man. You know, like, let me only say positive, encouraging things. And if you and I were selecting friends, then we'd probably rule him out of our list and say, nope, not him either. We'd end up ruling out a lot of people in our friendship list because you and I have this kind of fear of rejection. But Jesus, knowing that some of these individuals are going to reject him, he still selects them. He still chooses them. I mean, look at the name at the bottom of the list. There's a reason why he's at the very bottom of the list, Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Because he's infamously known to, when he heard that the religious leaders wanted to arrest Jesus, Judas went to those religious leaders and said, if you pay me 50 pieces, uh, sorry, 20 pieces of silver, then I will hand Jesus over to you. And so he had this money exchange, and then Judas handed Jesus over to them. And, he was, and then Jesus was arrested and eventually crucified. But he wasn't the only one who betrayed Jesus. Because after Jesus was arrested, um, we, have, we, hear this, we read the story of Simon Peter Peter was asked three different times by three different people on three different occasions, hey, don't you know Jesus? Aren't you a follower of Jesus? No, I recognize you. You really are a disciple of Jesus. And all three times he said, not me. I don't know him. I've never seen him. And then Peter runs away. Even Peter, who's at the top of this list, one of Jesus' closest followers, abandons Jesus. And it's not just Peter at the top of the list and Judas at the bottom of the list, but everyone in, the, in between on this whole list they all end up rejecting Jesus, turning their back on him, running away. And yet you and I, we have this fear of rejection that even if we were to send a text message that we didn't think was going to be replied to, I mean, we don't even want to send that text message, right? Or you send a text message to a friend or family member and you see those three little dots pop up where they're starting to write a reply and you immediately go, okay, good, they're going to reply. And then those three dots go away and a text never shows up. And you're like, well, what's happening? What's going on? Why, why aren't you replying? And it's this fear of rejection that we carry with us. And if we know someone is going to reject us, then we kind of reject them first. And we say, no, you're not even on my list. I don't even want to include you on a list of relationships that I want to start or strengthen in my life. And we can end up just crossing everyone off the list and saying, no, I'm going to overcomplicate it or I'm going to give up too easily. And I'm not going to start a new relationship in my life. And that's why we must begin by prayerfully seeking God and then carefully selecting friends. Because God can orchestrate that path and he can show us who he's placed in our life, whom we can love, and who we can demonstrate his loving kindness to in their lives. So if that's how we start relationships, the question is, how do we strengthen new relationships? Well, Jesus gives us a snapshot of that here in these last couple of verses. And I want to share those with you now. Starting in verse 17, this is what the passage says. It says that he went down with them and he stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. You see, this, you know what this gives us a snapshot of? Jesus' priority to love people that God's placed around him. And that is, how does Jesus strengthen this relationship? What's the first thing that he does after he picks these 12 individuals to spend time with? He says, all right, boys, come with me. We're going down the mountain. There is a group of people down there, and they all need a little extra attention and a little extra care. You're coming with me, and you're going to help me provide that care and attention to them. 
And so Jesus brings them down, and what do they do? It says that there's a group, the group of people, they want to hear from Jesus. So they want to talk with him and, and the disciples, and they want to be healed of their diseases. And those with impure spirits were cured. And all the people, look at this, all tried to touch him. Why? Because power was coming from him and healing them all. This, this kind of sounds like an introvert's worst nightmare, doesn't it? Like just people closing in around you and they all want to be around you. They all want to talk to you. They all want to touch you. They, and, and in that moment, you got to stop and say, what's happening right here? Jesus is showing us that the moment we surrender to the Lord and say, God, I, I want to live the type of life that you want me to live, then we have countless opportunities to demonstrate his love and kindness to the people around us. That is, to serve people. And so if you and I are looking to strengthen relationships with people in our lives, one of the best ways to do that is to regularly serve people, to regularly serve people. You see, to start a relationship, you prayerfully seek God and you carefully select friends. But then to strengthen that relationship, you do just what Jesus did and you regularly serve people. You and I know this. You've experienced this in your own life. No doubt, if you've ever participated in a mission trip, you've experienced this, that when you serve together, you grow closer together. If you were on one of our mission trips this past summer to Slovakia or Indonesia or Mexico, or you've ever been on one of those trips, then you know that when you get home from one of those trips, you have this, this stronger bond with the people that you served alongside with. Or maybe if you served at one of our summer camps this past summer um, for our next gen, for middle school, high school, young adults, or elementary school. You see, we had this record number of students that all signed up for camp, right? Do you remember this? And we said, okay, church, adults, who can go serve at camp? And, and hundreds of you, literally hundreds of you signed up to serve at camps this past summer. And when you showed up to camp, you were expecting to have this, make this great relationship and connection with students, and many of you did, but what you might have been surprised by is when you got home, you had this even stronger bond with people that you served alongside with. People who went to that camp, other adults that you were serving next to, and you got to know them. Why? Because when you serve together, you grow closer together. A lot of you have experienced that. I'm looking right down here, this section right here. I've got friends of mine that I've known for, for a long time. Nate White, Megan White, Josh Pritchett, Samantha Pritchett, Stephen Baumeister, oftentimes you're joined by Logan. The six individuals here were part of our college leadership team. Guys, what was it? 15 years ago? I mean, well over a decade ago. And, and it was this group that like served together. They said so you, you guys planned college ministry retreats, you led college ministry small groups, you did college ministry events, you, and you just made our Wednesday night college program happen week after week after week. Y'all served together as a leadership team, and I cherished those, those times serving with you guys. And now here we are, a decade and a half later, and you're all still friends, you're all still sitting together right here, and I know you guys have been in a community group together, you're raising kids together, you're, you're just doing life together. Um, and I, I hope and pray that you guys continue to have this relationship, this close bond for decades to come. Why? Because when you serve together, you grow close together. I, I think of not just these guys here in the front row, but I think of uh, another friend of mine. His name is Ralph. I brought a picture of Ralph. He was a, a usher here, um, part of New Heights for 20, 25 years. And uh, that means that he stood at the door, just like our ushers at all of our campuses. They greet people with a smile. They welcome you in. If the auditorium is full, they help you find a seat. They hand you a program. And for 20 years, Ralph did this. And then this past year, Ralph was diagnosed with cancer. And so Corey Hancock, the campus pastor from Central Vancouver, he and I went to visit Ralph and his wife, Judy, at the hospital. And while we were there and we went to pray with them and chat with them, and um, Ralph had said, look, I, I know, I, he, Ralph said, I know I'm going to die pretty soon. And he said, but when I leave this old body, he's laying on a hospital bed, and he said, when I leave this old body, I know that immediately I'm going to be with Jesus in heaven because I've placed my faith in Christ and I have confidence in him. Yeah. So when, uh, when Ralph started reflecting on his life then, reflecting back on years prior, he, Ralph said that one of his greatest highlights of life was serving at New Heights. And he said one of the reasons why it was a highlight for him is because of the relationships that he made with those he served with. And then Ralph started to recall, he said, he said look, I got, to, I got to be an usher with Dale Johnson and Al Johnson and John Halbert 
And he started listing off these names of guys. Some of them have already passed. Some of them are still here today. And, uh, and, and Ralph said, and you know, that set of relationships, those are the guys who have shown up and offered great support and encouragement through this cancer journey. So um, Ralph's uh, memorial service is next weekend. And here's what I predict. I predict that Ralph will have more ushers at his funeral than we've ever seen at any funeral before. (laughs) Why? Because he made such great relationships and connections with individuals he served alongside with. When you serve together, you grow together. You build lifelong friendships with those people that you serve side by side with. One of the greatest ways to strengthen relationships is to serve side by side with someone. And it's not just Ralph, but you all get this too. Many of you experience this in your own life. And some of you are here and you're saying, okay, I get it. I I, want to do that, but I don't know where to start. You came to the right place. (laughs) Because there's countless opportunities here at New Heights and beyond where you can bring a friend along with you and say, hey, let's serve together side by side. I don't know if you know this, but last weekend, during homecoming weekend, um, here at Central Vancouver and then at East Vancouver, um, we, were, we were sending families away from our kids' ministry because our, our rooms were at capacity. We didn't have enough volunteers who could be in the classrooms. So we didn't have enough people to take care of the kiddos. So we sent families and kids away and said, uh, sorry, we don't have space for you. If we have space, we'll call you. We'll let you know. And not just at those two campuses, but really at all of our campuses. We have this tremendous need to help with, take care of kiddos during the worship services. And imagine the impact if you said to your friend, hey, you know what, let's just take one weekend a month and let's go serve with the, those kids and, and help the kiddos during, during service. Not only are you blessing those kids, but you're also blessing the parents, you're blessing the church, and you end up building this relationship, strengthening this relationship with those that you're serving with. It's funny how the Lord takes our serving efforts and multiplies them tenfold when he's at the center of our lives and the center of our relationships. Some of you are saying, oh, well, okay, Matt, but I'm not real good around kids. Great. How about coffee? Did you know that New Heights served 70,000 cups of coffee last year? Yeah, that means we need people brewing coffee 24-7, you know, 365 days a year just to push the coffee out into the lobby in time. And so do you want to make coffee? Do you want to greet guests when they come in? Do you want to be an usher like Ralph and hand programs and help people find seats? Um, All of those opportunities are available, and you just grab someone and say, all right, let's go serve together. Let's sign up together, and let's serve together side by side. And some of you are saying, all right, well, I I can't serve every week like that. All right, what about occasionally? We do occasional events and activities here at New Heights, like homecoming weekend last weekend, or new to New Heights lunch coming up in a few weeks, or the Thanksgiving sharing table coming up, or the, or the Thanksgiving table coming up, or the Christmas sharing tree that's coming up. And we have these kind of um, uh, ho- holiday events and activities where we're reaching out into the community and supporting people in need in our community, and we're always looking for people, additional people to serve in those occasional ways. And some of you are saying, all right, Matt, hold on, time out. Is this just a commercial to try to get me to sign up to volunteer at New Heights? No, that's not what this is about. This is about inviting the Lord into the center of your life and then saying, okay, Lord, who are the people you've placed in my life who I can serve? And if it means you don't serve at New Heights, fine. Don't serve at New Heights. Serve at your kid's school or serve at the food bank or a shelter or wherever the Lord leads you. But when you do so, don't just serve for serving's sake, but invite a friend to come alongside you and First, prayerfully seek God. Second, carefully select your friends. And third, regularly serve people in need around you. When we do that, we see the Lord working in us and through us in a powerful way. And nothing strengthens relationships quite like serving together. When you hear that, if you are saying, okay, I'm interested, how do I find out more? Well, every week, we always direct your attention to the program, don't we? And every week, we always invite you to fill out the connection card on the back. And in fact, earlier in this service, we've already asked you to fill that out and to tear it off and to drop in the offering bus- bucket as it went by. And, um, and some of you did that. Others of you, if you're just hanging on to that for this moment right now, then you could certainly do that. Every week or this week, you can tell us who you are. And there's a little box here that says, what's your next step? Serving at New Heights. Check that box. And if there's an area in particular that, um, that's of interest to you, just simply write it right down here. Say kids ministry or tech ministry or 
one of the 70,000 cups of coffee. I could help make, I could help brew that coffee. And then um, you can tear that off. You can drop it in a bucket uh, on, on your way out of our auditoriums today, or you can hand it to one of our ushers, or you can fill out that card next week. And again, what I want you to hear is this. We're not just serving simply because we're trying to fill a hole or fill a gap at New Heights. That's not what we're interested in. Rather, we want each one of us to experience how the Lord can work in us and through us. Jesus has invited us into a relationship with him. And when we follow him, we see countless opportunities to love people that he's placed in our lives. We don't do that on our own strength. We do it on his strength. So I want to take a moment. I want to ask the Lord for his strength in our lives. Please join me. We'll pray together. Father in heaven, again, we, we thank you that you are a relational God. That is, that you desperately desired to have a relationship with each one of us. And you made a way for us to have a relationship with you by coming to this earth to be with us as Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for even how Jesus modeled to us what starting a relationship looks like, what strengthening a relationship looks like. And Lord, while we do ask that you would help us to start and strengthen relationships in our life, we recognize that the place for us to begin is not with other people, but the place for us to begin is in your presence. So Lord Jesus, please help us to come into your presence and to experience the peace that you provide each one of us. Because when we're in your presence, we discover that we are no longer lonely and isolated, but we can have a life rich with meaning as a result of following you. And Lord, still we recognize that there are people that you've placed around us, people that you want us to engage with, people you want us to invite into our lives, people that you want us to have relationships with. So would you please help us to love those people that you've placed in our life and to carefully select that group of friends that, you've, that you're calling us to pursue. And then, Lord, give us opportunities to regularly serve the people that you place around us. Let it not be on our own strength, but you working through us. Lord, we thank you for how you're calling each one of us into this type of a life to fully surrender to you. We look forward to seeing how you're going to work in us and through us in the days ahead. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.